Tonight we are blessed with the presence of the author, uh, Lowell Thompson, who uh, will be speaking to us on the subject of Race Man Answers, America's Toughest Questions on Race, Inequality, and More. Uh, he will tell us uh, more about himself and about uh, how he came to the subject and uh, his experience with it and his thoughts on the subject. Uh, so without further ado, we will hear from our speaker. It is great to once again be in front of this august. Are you sure? Wait a minute, it's October. Yeah. Is it? Oh, it's October. I'm sorry. This October group. And I don't know if. I don't know how many people who are here tonight were here uh, a couple of years ago when I gave my first presentation to this October group. But uh, I was talking about this book. I just published this book, African Americans in Chicago. It's a pictorial history of African Americans starting at the time of the first non-native settler in this area, uh, Dusabo. Yeah. But tonight, I want to go much further and deeper. I don't want to just talk about African Americans. I want to talk about the human, well, really the human species, but in colloquial terms, the human race. But before I do that, I want to get my computer working here, where my notes are. I want to make a statement that I think will get things going in the right direction. Um, and it's a statement by a, one of the leading lights of the Enlightenment. From what I understand, it was made in 1758, and the gentleman's name is Sir David Hume, H-U-M-E. And I'll read just the uh, most pertinent part here, so because I, I want to get through this quick, and I want to get people uh, re responding. And I quote, I am apt to suspect the Negroes, and in general all the species of men, the other species of men, and there are four different kinds, to be naturally inferior to the whites. There was never a civilized nation of any complexion other than white, nor even any individual eminent in either action or speculation. No ingenious manufacturers among them, no arts, no sciences. This is Sir David Hume, one of the leading lights of the Enlightenment. And you may say, well, if David said it, it must be true. Ah, what year was it? This was 1758 or thereabouts. And the reason I brought it up is because this is basically the, the, the basis of my book. My book is about how what we talk of today is racism. American racism in particular, how it came to be. Now I know it's a verboten subject in most, most places, especially in mixed company. But I want to talk of it tonight because I think 
after 20 years, I have found the answer. And the answer is encompassed in one word. Anybody know what that word is? Exploitation. That's good. But Racism. my what? Racism. No, I'm talking about the answer, not the question. Slavery. That's a good one, but not that. It's a one syllable word. The answer. Before I give you the answer, though. Climate. Ask the question again. Climate. Two syllables. No, no. Sir Thompson, ask the question again. I didn't have it. You didn't have a question? No, not really. Okay, the question is, uh, I had said that I had been looking for the answer to racism, and I've been at it for about 20 years. And I have found the answer, and it's encompassed in one word, one, a one-syllable word. And I'm asking what that word is. Love. That's interesting. He's met the criteria for being one syllable. How many it's letters? the wrong answer, but it's one syllable. <laughs> so you gotta handle that. I mean, from my point of view, it's the wrong answer. It's not my answer, so. How many letters? Uh, okay, how many letters? That's interesting. It's, it's five letters. Slave. That's good, but it's not the answer. <laughs> but I'm gonna be through. Fight? No, no. That's good. Yes. But that's Truth. not the answer. What? Truth. Truth is good. You guys are pretty good, I gotta admit. These are all five left words. No. Before I give you the answer, I want to show a, uh, do a little demonstration. And I'm going to bring up a couple of items. And I'm going to ask everybody in the room, everybody who's white in the room, Every white person in the room, raise their hand. So-called white. Okay, are we getting uh, uh, AJ? Could you could you could you the get these people who are raising their hands? I just want to get get some sense of who the white people in the room. Okay, how many hands are here? One, two, three, four. He's whitish. Five, six, seven. Okay, we got about seven or eight. White people in the room. With apologies. We got one whitish. And with apologies, we got one other one. Okay, now, I want all the uh, black people in the room to raise their hands. Okay, we got one blackish, and then we got this gentleman here. Okay. But, but blood, is, your DNA is like. Now, here's, now here's my, my, my demo. This is my test. This is the Thompson test, racial test. I want all the people who think they're white to put their hand on this board and compare it to this, which is white. I want all the people in the room who think they're white to put their hand on this board and compare it and tell me if you're white. Okay, now, and all the people, all the people who think they're black, I want them to put their hand on this board. Why did I do that? Why did I do that demonstration? Because I want to make a point. It's an obvious point, and all children know it. They can look at a person that we call white and say, that person's not white. That person's closer to pink. And they can look at a person who is my color, which is not black. Since I'm an artist, I would say it's more of a burnt umber. You see what I'm saying? So, so the question is, why is it that people who are pink and people who are burnt umber and every shade in between call themselves either black or white in this country? Which brings me to the word. What is the word? That is the answer to the race question. Color. That's good. He did it again. 
you got a five letter word, but it's wrong. The word is brand. B R A N D. As in brand, branding cattle, branding property. You're talking about like mix? Branding. Mix? No. Like mix? No. No. I'm talking about branding, like a branding iron. When you brand cattle, when you when you well hey you're getting ahead of, you're getting ahead of me. I'm talking about the brand as it relates to branding cattle, branding property, and branding human beings. And by branding them, turning them into subhumans. I, maybe I should maybe I should back up a little. I have pickles. Because my background is advertising. I spent thirty five years in the advertising agency business. I was one of the first African Americans in the big time ad agency business. I got my first job in nineteen sixty eight, three months after Dr. King was killed in Memphis and the riots that happened all over the country following that. And corporate America, for the first time, opened itself up to non-whites in professional positions. That's how I got my first job in advertising. Luckily, at some point, I decided to turn what I'd learned in advertising into solving the race problem. And as, as I said, after 20 years of thinking about it and figuring it out, I've come to the one word solution, brand. Brand as in branding cattle, brand as in branding humans, and turning them into subhumans based on their skin color. And then brand, as this gentleman said, the whitest gentleman over there, who got ahead of me a few minutes ago, brand as in McDonald's, the golden arch. Brand as in Coca-Cola. Brand as in Apple computers. Brand as in Google. You, the two, the, the, the epiphany I had was that the two types of brand and branding are the products of the country, the nation, that is the most sophisticated branding, advertising, communications, ma mass manipulation entity in the history of the world. And what is that place? United the States. United States of America. A fascism. Now, that's another discussion. This discussion is about race and about the idea of how here we are in the year 2014 why we still have a race problem. But not only that, the beauty part is when I started to think about this, I discovered that not only is did I solve the race problem, as a bonus, I solved the problem of inequality in America. What some would call the white-on-white -white inequality in America, that we're all so up in arms about now because of the recession. But as soon as things start going good, good again, then everybody's back with the old, the oligarchs are the guys who create the jobs. The Mitt Romney uh, philosophy of the oligarchs, who I call the Americrats. You've heard of, of aristocrats? You've heard of Americans? Well, I call them, this is my word, <laughs> Americrats. The Americrats tell us, tell you, and tell all the all so-called other whites, like they are, that they are equal. After all, Thomas Jefferson said it. One of the, one of the great Americrats, one of the greatest of all time. He said, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. So, 
The Americrats have said to us that we are equal. And yet, here we are in the year 2014, and we have the greatest inequality between not blacks and whites, but whites and whites. And what is that? How does that relate to my concept of branding? Well, just as the Africans and the African Americans were branded as subhumans in order for the slaveholders to justify treating them as beasts and not as humans, they had to treat, even though they treated the English who were here, who came over uh, at that time in the, in the in the early colony, even though they treated those people almost like they treated slaves or as badly as they treated slaves, but they could not treat them as subhumans because of the laws of England. So they had to treat them as humans even though they didn't treat them well. And they had to release them at some point. And they had to give them uh, uh, something based on the contract they signed to come over here. So they had the problem. How do we get a workforce that is that has no human rights. You brand them. You brand those humans and you say those humans are not humans. Just like you brand Coca-Cola and say this soda water, this water is some great drink. Or you brand McDonald's hamburgers and say this is nutritious food. They branded people like me and said these people are not humans, they're subhumans. So we can treat them however we want. And then they granted the, the Englishmen, who up to that point were just poor Englishmen, servants, and did your servants, they branded them and said, hey, from now on, you are white. You are superhuman. You are better than, than human. Or at least you have the right to aspire to be. You could be as superhuman as I am because you're white. So my book is not just about the branding of Africans and African Americans as subhumans. My book is about the branding of so-called whites as superhumans, especially the Americrats. And so that every person who raised their hand in this room when I held up this white board who thinks they're white, I hate to tell you, You've been took. You've been had. You've been bamboozled. I got that from Malcolm. You have been sold not a bill of rights. You've been given not a bill of rights, but sold a bill of goods. And the reason that you're in the predicament you're in right now, the reason this country is in the predicament it's in, is because you have bought that bill of goods. And you're still buying it. That's what's amazing to me. This has been going on for over 400 years. And yet the people who raise their hands, and the people who not, and this is not to single you out, because I understand why you think you're white. And why you think that because you're white, you have special access to the ladder up to the Americrats. <laughs> but I hate to tell you, although some of you may be beginning to suspect it, you don't. You're just another brand that the Americrats created for the purpose of what? For gaining money and power. They turn the Africans into subhuman beasts so that they can work them like animals and let them spend their whole lives as non-humans so they could build the wealth, their personal wealth, and the wealth of this country. The wealth of this country is based on that. Now you may say, well that's slavery, that's a long time ago, why don't you people get over it? But I'm not talking about this as an African American, I'm talking about this as an American. And I'm saying that <laughs> The problem is, is that this country, and the reason the country is as screwed up as it is, and that the Americrats, the one-tenth of one percent, have even more power than ever, is because they have 
branded you and branded your brain to believe that you guys are equal to them. That all you have to do is go along with the program and you will be fine. And you will someday uh, be walking the streets of gold with Mitt Romney and the boys. <laughs> but I hate to tell you, my book, and I should show you the book, it's a revolutionary design. You saw this book. This is by a publisher, Arcadia. This is by me. This is my book. It's a revolutionary design because it's designed for people who don't read books. I'm not talking about illiterates. I'm talking about post-literates. Now think about that one. He gets it. Anti-literates. Not anti. Post. This is designed for you to, to, to read, to look at, while you are on the bus, waiting in the, in the doctor's office. It's got pictures. It's got words. It's got new words that I created, neologisms. Ameriquats, that's one. I made that up. Black years. You ever hear black years? Well, I've lived them, 67. You know what a black year is? It's like seven times a white year. You see what I'm saying? You get it. You get my drift, right? So, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I know you're busy. I just want to see this concept. I want you to think. And then think again. And then think some more. Because the whole future of the country, of maybe, like Lincoln said, the last best hope of Earth may be in this room. You people right now, being able to finally think beyond, hey, I'm white, I'm a made member of the, of the club, and all I got to do is go along with the program, and Mitt and all those other guys are going to like me, and they're going to really look out for me in the end. I need you to think beyond that and start thinking for yourselves. Thinking about what the truth and the reality of this country is. And not say, oh, woe is me and give up, but to say, hey, okay, now that I know what's happening, I'm a sentient being. I didn't make it up sentient. You know what sentient is, right? Okay. I'm a sentient being. I can think. If I can get myself in this mess, I can get myself out. But it requires thinking. It requires new thinking, rethinking. Now remember, I'm just about through here. I want to. I want to get your response. A lot of times, when people, when I give people this kind of information, they get so intimidated. Or they, it, the, the information is so overwhelming that they don't say anything. They just sit there. And I don't want that to happen because this is the College of Complexes. I know this man will speak. Uh. I'm not allowed to speak during the program. Okay, well, after the program, he will speak. <laughs> and I want everybody here to say, hey, you're wrong. You're crazy. That's stupid. Sit down. That's fine. But I want you to give me a logical, rational argument, not an emotional one. One thing I learned, I wrote a book, my first book I wrote in 1995. It was called, I hope you're ready for this, White Folks. <laughs> Subtitle, Seeing America Through Black Eyes. And in that book, one of the things that I learned, that was my first thinking about race yeah. Yeah. and combining what I learned in that, then combining what I learned in advertising and race. And one of the things that I learned is that racism is not personal. People respond personally when people say, oh, you're a racist. 
Or well, they say, oh, that guy, Bob, he's a racist, or he's white, he's black, blah, blah, And they get into a big argument based on, well, I'm not a racist, blah, blah, who you call a racist, blah, blah. Well, racism is not personal. Or at least the racism that we have to worry about. I mean, there are always going to be people who say, hey, I don't like this person because they're tall. They talk too much. They're stupid. They stink. Whatever, right? That's a personal preference. The problem with this country is that this country has been built on the idea of white supremacy and black inferiority, just like the quote I read, the David, David Hume quote, where he said, as far as he was concerned, there was no civilization. I'm talking about, this is in 1758. China had been around for thousands of years. He said there would have been no civilization other than white people. This is after Egypt, which if you went to Egypt, based on where it was and what it was, there's no way that anybody walking around there could be called white. And yet he's saying, this is David Hume, the, the, the light of the Enlightenment, saying that he, as far as he was concerned, he didn't know of any civilization other than white folks, white civilization. What does that tell you? David Hume was a PR man. He was a like a Pat Buchanan. He was like a think tank a, a guy. He gets paid to spew the company line. Hey, we're all white, so it's okay to kill everybody else, take everything else from everybody else in the world. Because we're white. I mean on This is the guy that's the leading of the leader leader of the enlightenment. Did you want, uh, John Locke, another enlightened guy, <laughs> okay, then he was a big <laughs> investor in slave ships. That's how he made his money. <laughs> and these guys are supposed to be the leading lights of the enlightened. These are the guys we look up to. These are the guys that Thomas Jefferson looked up to. That's where he got his material. And Jefferson was one of the great PR guys in all of all time. I mean, imagine the guy sitting there holding two or three hundred slaves, writing all men are created equal. You don't think that's PR, that's propaganda, that's hype, thank design? You. That's, thank you for saying that. Really, thank you for saying that. You're welcome. There's only a very, very few people who are at the backbone to say that. Thank you. Can thank you repeat you. that statement? Well, I don't know if I can repeat it. It's, I'm saying, but I will paraphrase it. Thomas Jefferson, and I said this, as a matter of fact, I said it first in a book that you guys should get. I brought some reading material for you beside my book. This is a book that I worked on with a guy named Tom Burrell. He owned the largest black ad agency in the country for ye that was for years. He's retired now. But in this book, we call Thomas Jefferson the greatest what, PR guy, marketing man in history. He was great. He wrote this stuff with a straight face. And it was designed to sell the people at that point, the people who he wanted to fight the war. This is Remember, this is before or during, just as the Revolutionary War was starting, when he wrote this line. And he wanted to get the average, so-called, the guys he was now trying to call white, who he before just called trash, trying to get them to join the army, to fight the war, to, to take the land from the British, so that, guess what? He and Washington and all those other guys owned it. It was their land now. It wasn't the guys who fought the war's land. So he wrote this line, hey, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Now as soon as the war was as soon as the war was over, guess what? They weren't equal enough to get a piece of land without some money. They weren't equal enough to vote unless they had the land. Thank you, Lana. So anyway, I think I've laid it out well enough. 
And I want to get some response if anybody has the backbone. Okay. Okay. You're gonna you're gonna you're gonna pick the people. Yeah. I'll <laughs> well, Africa. Actually, if you look at the uh, the continent of Africa, it has more difference in DNA than any other continent in the world. I think you mean diversity, don't you? Not different? Diversity, yeah. Right. Well, what about it? Well, just tell him question. he wants a response. Okay, that's the response. Do you wish to respond to the response? No, I think you're right. I mean, as far as I know, I mean, I'm not a geneticist or a biologist, no, but latest, from what I understand... The latest evidence. Yes, and... I mean, the fact is, as I understand it, is that it is pretty much agreed by any leg most legitimate 95 percent, 98 percent of the uh, geneticists and scientists who study these things, that every human, all humans, came out of Africa. We're all Africans in that sense. Right. Carl Sweat? Uh, I actually, I wanted to maybe slightly off topic here. Mm -hmm. The current uh, news story that's been out has been about uh, African uh, American families beating their kids, and I mean, we heard it. I heard it from several other announcers that that was that's what we do. Is sir, that, I'll be right there with them. Is that true? You and, 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 and were you beaten as a child? They're up front, sir. Oh, you yeah. bet I was. <laughs> well, how do you think I turned out to be yeah. the man I am? No, I don't. Know. Okay. I'll put it I mean, and the idea that, that white, so-called white kids weren't beating as children? How many, how many people here were, were not beaten as children? That's right. I mean, this is, uh, this, is, this is another part of the propaganda. So what, I mean, now it's like, okay, black, there must be something, there must be something, uh, 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 what? Uncivilized about yeah, black people because they right. beat their children. That is uncivilized. But it's but but it's not but it's not a crime for black people. That doesn't make it any less uncivilized. Well, that's a, that's another issue. That's another issue. You see what I'm saying? I have a question. All right, then, Weinberg. Yeah. Uh, the whole idea that white people or whatever, they, they took over the country and then they put slaves in and blah, blah, blah. I understand that. That's great. What about black uh, politicians in Africa? Are they as ruthless and as racist and as power-hungry like Idi Amin? I mean, are they as crazy as Thomas Jefferson and James Madison? Or are they unique? And great and nice to everybody in the country. That's a very good question. Thank you. And my answer is, and my answer is that I don't know, but I do know. But wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me let me let me answer you. He just asked the question. Now he's telling me he knows. All right, all right. Okay, you want to hear the answer? Or you want to tell me the answer? No, I want to hear. I want to hear. I, I like to engage in in rational debate. This is not personal. I know. I understand. Okay. This I don't know what the what the laws are in where in uh, Uganda where Amen was. I don't know what the laws were in any of the lands where Africans sold other Africans to the Europeans. I don't know anything about that. But I do know what the laws are and what the so-called Constitution and the Bill of Rights and the promise of this country is. Yeah. To compare what happened any place else on earth to what happens here is obfuscation at best. Or maybe you didn't mean it to be obfuscating. But it's just not rational. Okay, if I can ask a question really quick. 
say again, I'm from Russia. I'm from Soviet Union. From Russia, different country, different planet. So my question is, uh, following that question, my question is, if uh, I like when you say Bill of Rights, okay, actually in general word, Bill of Rights, it's good, good word. But what if government in, uh, like, uh, you know, different African uh, no, countries, right? What if they not follow the rules? Bill of Rights, they also can be prosecuted like uh, uh, general citizens and, and throw to jail or to pay fine or, or they treat differently. Thank you. I don't know. I have no clue what's going on in Africa. I got to tell you, my beat is the United States of America. Thank you. Okay. McClellan. I don't have a question, but I do have a comment. Oh, oh, oh. Save it for the rebuttal oh, period. Okay, I'm sorry. My fault. All right. Charlie? Yeah, you know, we had a speaker a few years ago who spoke on the accomplishments of the Europeans. And in all disciplines, whether it be medicine, literature, music, the arts, architecture, I mean, when they decided to modernize the country such as Russia, they turned to these Europeans for guidance and assistance. So, whereas the author you began with is talking about the accomplishments of his culture. Robert, and those are not cheesecake? false claims. By no means. What's cake? the question? <coughs> well, do you, do you say you don't want to acknowledge? No, it's, it's see. All the Nobel Prizes are where? This, this is a culture that's gotten out ahead. Uh, is that a rhetorical question? Well, do you, you I'm asking, is that, is, do you want an answer? Oh, whatever. Ah, All right, right. Do, do you want an answer? Wait, I'm you asking, answer do, question. do you right. want an answer? All right, yeah. Because you're asking as though you already have the answer. Ah, well, I don't think It that. sounds like it's a rhetorical question. I, is it? Is, is that culture not superior to the other? So you're saying you believe in white supremacy? Ah. <laughs> is that, wait a minute, is that what you just said? Ah. Wait a minute, wait a minute, let him say what he said. I is said that what you said? I was talking about European. <laughs> so is that white or what, what now is that? You get, now you're going on to further define it. You're branding it. You're trying to brand it. It's European culture. Okay, That's so you're saying it, don't call it white. Don't call it white. They don't, they don't call it a white culture. They call it European culture. That's they don't? Wait, wait a minute. They don't you're call it white? To brand it. Wait a minute. You say they don't? What about American? Mm -hmm. is, America, is America Europe? <laughs> yes, it, it, it's... They began by trying to... You say it is? America yeah. is Europe? Yes. <laughs> so you're talking about white culture? Yes. You don't At least I got them to admit that. <laughs> Come on. I'm, I'm trying to get you... I'm trying to have a, a logical, rational discussion here. We're, we're, I'm trying to get you to be honest, straightforward. You aren't aware that we were a British colony? Yeah, that's off. That's what off. culture do you think we got? That's off, Why would we that, get our that's off the subject. Wouldn't we get our culture that's from off the other subject. country? Uh, Mr. Paydock, that's off the subject. You, you, said, you, just, you just asked the question and then you tried to answer it instead of allowing me to answer it. I got a question. Well, yes, Wait a minute, why, why, why don't you let me answer his question? Yeah, answer his What's his question? No, because he, ke he keeps obfuscating and going off in another direction instead of having me ask the, answer the question. Was that guy wrong in, in his assessment? Of yes, he was wrong. Have you ever heard of Egypt? Is that European culture? We're talking, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're talking about a period of, of the European slash American, the Anglo culture, being dominant in the world for maybe 600 years or so in a, a spectrum of time. Not just of time, of human civilization. We're talking about, in terms of just civilization, we're talking about six or 7,000 years, right? Instead of 600 years. 
And if you just take it from the point of view of, hey, here we are within this 600-year period, aren't we great because we're doing great in this 600-year period? Instead of looking at anything else, that looks like you're kind of weighing the scales. Yes. But yeah, you're yes. weighing the scales. You began. Huh? You began with a judgment. Excuse me? You began with a judgment. Which was what? He was wrong. Yeah, and I'm saying he was wrong. And what's that? I just explained it. We're talking about a period of 600 years of European dominance over a period of civilization of 6,000 years and of human existence of hundreds of thousands, human, human species of existence of hundreds of thousands of years of the, of the planet existing billions of years, and you're talking about that, that much time that the Europeans right. are in control. Oh, right. So what does that prove? Nothing. Hearing <laughs> question from Gene Autry. Uh, Mr. Speaker, let me ask you a favor. It's coming right up, Speaker. Would you do it for me? That would be this is my question. Okay. When somebody like this guy asked that silly question, uh -huh. Don't spend my time and your time responding to it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but see, the, pro the problem is, is that the world uh, 90, you know the answer. The world you, 90 million years old with 90 million different types of people, he going to talk about some bullshit. Right, right, right. Well, see, the, the thing is, is that you know that, yeah. but most of the people in this room don't. That's why he feels comfortable asking yeah, that, I feel comfortable asking that you, rhetorical question. I'm asking you to do me a favor. But you don't have to. My question, okay. my question is the branding of uh, the presidency. Uh, is, uh, with the election of Barack Hussein Obama, our president, uh, does that D the white of the presidency and uh, uh, vote of the federal government, or does it uh, uh, raise uh, not being white, according to the U.S. Uh, customary definitions of whiteness? Right. Uh, Oh, sorry. It's okay. Uh, what do you say say is happening there? Let me say this. If you don't remember this, when Barack Obama ran the first time, he ran against John McCain and Sarah Palin. If it were only up to people in this country who call themselves white, Sarah Palin would be possibly president by now. God forbid. There you go. More than, I think, 52% of the voting white public voted for John McCain and Sarah Palin. Okay, second time around. You didn't know that? Nobody knew that? I did. Okay, okay, more than about 51, 52% voted for mccain Palin. Second time, you would think, well, hey, he's been president for four years. Uh, people who thought, well, hey, a black man can't do it because he just hadn't, doesn't have a big enough brain, blah, blah, blah. Okay, they see that he can do the job. Even if they don't like the job, they see that he can do it, as well as George Bush. Right? Uh -huh. right. And, and, and yet, when Mitt Romney and Ryan ran, Guess what percentage of the white population, voting population, voted for that? Like 59%. So, to answer your question, the answer is that if it's up to the white population, this country is going to go back and put people like me back in the chains. That's what the whites voted for. <clears throat> I'm talking about the majority. Luckily, 40 some percent of the so called whites voted for the person who, in those two contests, yes. was the best man. 
Now, you may disagree with me, but I'm saying that 40-some percent, my hope is that 40-some percent of the whites who are ready to go beyond the black or white, and remember, Barack Obama is both black and white, and so am I, and probably most of black folks in America. So this whole, my whole point is that it's up to the Urams, I call them, not white, Urams. I'm an Afram. It's up to the Urams to finally say, hey, let's give up this white supremacist stuff. The world is about, what, three quarters non-white. The whole concept of white people being supreme is BS. It was a glitch in time. It was a mistake. And we should admit it. We made mistakes and we undo it. And we, and intelligent people, when they make a mistake, they look at it, they admit it, and then they change. Right, uh, Tim Bolger. So basically your premise then is that our civilization grew not because of white supremacy or whatnot, or branding, so to speak. Where does capitalism, globalization, and connectivity fit in? Well, my premise is that this nation grew because of white supremacy, the concept of white supremacy, the uh, denigration, dehumanization of humans, in order to turn them into animals so that they can be treated like such, to build the wealth of the country, the labor force of the country to build the wealth. The basic economy, the first brand I say in this book, the first big brand in this country was not McDonald's or Coke uh, or whatever. It was slavery. That was the first big brand. That's the basis on which this economy was built. But didn't the uh, Egyptians, Romans, and... But they weren't Americans. Several of the other cultures too. They weren't the Americans. They weren't. They weren't. They didn't have a constitution that said that all men are created equal, or a Declaration of Independence that said all men are created equal. They, they, this is something that's very difficult for it seems for most whites to understand. This is a different country from the rest of the world. This country has a set of laws, a concept that they like to tout most of the time. Mm -hmm. But this is what makes this country, theoretically, different from every other country on the face of the earth. That's the new part. And instead of always comparing yourself to somebody who is a, a dictatorship, <laughs> oh, well, well, we're better than, the, than Hitler. <laughs> Come on. Okay, okay. Sid Yeah, um, didn't Greece get us culture from Africa? Wasn't Cleopatra Greek? I think you may have something there, Sid. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay. laughs> That's bad. Okay, okay. I, I have a simple question. Are you for reparations? Oh, okay, here we go. Okay, here we go. No, I think reparations. Uh, repar uh, all your reparations. Can I say, can I say something? Your old rep reparations trope. Uh, no, here I we go. Actually, you're owed about three trillion dollars. So no, no, probably three, try three hundred trillion. Okay. Uh, and it's not, and it's not just slavery. See, who's wait, wait a minute. Yeah, but who's counting? Right? But it's not just slavery. See, this, this is another uh, thing that that uh, uh, another uh, piece of obfuscation and de uh, denial. Now listen to what I'm saying. Yeah. Slavery, there's a, there's a, I think there's a book out right now, it just came out. Slavery wasn't the half of it. Since slavery, slavery supposedly ended in 1866 or so, at the end of the Civil War. But after slavery, you ever hear, hear of the, the uh, um, Reconstruction and the, and the uh, resegregation of the South and the Ku Klux Klan and all this stuff, and the denial of human rights to African Americans, mm -hmm. up to the Civil Rights Movement, yes. and then the begrudging 
giving of whatever rights were squeezed out, yeah. and and now still the the sub Rosa discrimination that is a part of the American culture. You ever hear that stuff? Yeah, 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 yeah. So don't. I mean, the, hey, well, you you guys want to get paid for slavery? I don't, I don't follow. Up. That was 150 years ago. Grow up. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. The the population of the United States will soon be more than half non-white. Oh. So um, I'll be dead probably. A lot of these people in this room will be dead. But but do you think the the, the country will have a better chance of survival then? Yes. Good. That's an easy one. <laughs> the gentleman in the hat, back there, the fedora. Um, okay. I come to this. Uh, and Louder. Can you speak up, please? I'm new to this forum and have never um, asked a question, but I think it, I think it was actually covered in one of his responses. Uh, recently, uh, in the, at the end of uh, 2012, louder, please. Recently, at the end of 2012, the year 2012, 20s. Yeah, December. Hang on, hang on. December. 12, uh, 2012, you need a mic? Might, it might interfere. Um, Thank you, Jim. Sure. We may have some interference problems, but try it anyway. Uh, I'll tell you what, to just... Uh, just leave it. I think, I think... Um, okay. something which happened, uh, which happens only every 25,800 years. And that is a total in, a supposed inversion of the Earth's whatever. Okay. If, in fact, you realize how many societies we have buried, and I think someone has already uh, pointed out the fact that um, Africa is in fact a Greek word that in fact uh, most of the uh, concepts of Africa were created by European civilization that in fact uh, uh, Pythagoras uh, could not have developed his theorem unless of course uh, pyramids can be developed without that uh, knowledge of the relationship of the right triangles uh, components. Um, Just go ahead and turn it off and shout. Huh? Turn it off and shout. Shout. I'll shout. Okay. <laughs> Well, why don't you stand in and go ahead and 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 and, and, and shout. Given given the simple mathematical operation of twenty five thousand eight hundred divided into the number of uh, millions of years that humans humans have been considered hominids on the planet, that is, sentient beings. Don't I got you realize realize I how many times I know total knowledge of previous civilizations has totally okay. vanished from the planet. So how could you, for the last 600 years, claim superiority or any knowledge of previous civilizations? Okay. Um, did you hear his question? Dead corpse. Did you hear his question? I think basically that was a rhetorical question that he had not answered. Why don't you respond anyway? Okay. And what do you think about that? Yeah, I think he's right. There you go. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, do you have more questions? Thank you. All right, then. All right, the idea that, like he said, History, every civilization destroys the previous uh, civilization, if you want to call it that, 
And so they, they, all knowledge of it is destroyed. I, I work in a library, and the people, there's a history room. And the people, well, some people, I mean, this no, not, my, not where I work. But let's say another place where somebody else might work. They, they might destroy all the knowledge previous. So, I mean, that's my question. No, I think, I think that happens, and probably Africans were great and did great things. It's just, it's all destroyed. What? You just don't notice them. Ah, uh, right. right. uh, David, I do too. Uh, loud, Dave. Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence, and in it, he wrote that uh, everyone was supposed to be free. Um, so when you say he was a um, uh, the best PR man ever, uh, he was um, writing something for freedom for all the people. It was Rutledge who argued that if they didn't put in a clause or strike a clause to allow for slavery, then we would not have had a revolution because the, um, he controlled a block of southern colonies. Uh, I also want to point out that Mr. Franklin worked very hard. He wanted to see that um, black children were given an education. So I want to know why you failed to mention those two things. Well, the thing about Jefferson, and we can, we can argue forever about uh, the particulars of who wrote the Declaration of Independence what, how much was struck in, uh, was stricken by the committee that appointed Jefferson to write the declaration, why it was struck. We could go on forever. And there are, there are professors who argue this point over and over, back and forth, and nobody has settled anything. So I'm not going to settle it here as, as it relates to Jefferson and what was struck and not struck from the Declaration of Independence when he wrote it. Uh, as it relates to Franklin, I don't know about what you said about Franklin. I didn't mention Ben Franklin. You did. And the difference between somebody saying, hey, I think black children should be educated, and them saying that I think that African Americans should be equal citizens in this country, that's a big difference. And I don't know if Jefferson or any of those guys ever said that. Even Lincoln, the great Lincoln, did not believe in equality, in the equality of the races. He eventually came to believe in at least that blacks should be able to uh, be citizens and that they should, depending upon their intelligence, be able to have more access to more things of citizenship. But he never, as far as I know, got to the point where he believed that African Americans as a group should be equal citizens to whites in this country. And that brings us back to the, my issue. My issue is not about slavery. It's not about whether Jefferson was a nice guy or not. It's about the history of the country and the selling and the branding of humans as white and superior and the branding of humans as black and inferior and subhumans. That's what my point is. And my book is about how it was done, why it was done, and also how it relates to now and the inequality that is a part of American culture between whites and so-called whites and other whites. Because the whites who have been gone along with the program and let the Americrats basically root, run everything and, and run a pseudo, this is not a democracy, one. Does anybody uh, disagree with me that we're not, this is not a democracy, right? 
Anybody uh, have anything to counter that? Where this is not a democracy. Where this is at best a this is at best an aspiring potential democratic republic. Would you like more votes? So, all I'm saying to you is that because whites still are the majority, the people who are called white are still the majority in this country, it would be great if they would start to actually believe in the country and think as citizens in a democrat, an aspiring democratic republic to make it more of a democracy and less of a hypocrisy. Okay. Any other questions? Let's I'd, see. Yeah. Tim Bolger. I'd like you to comment. There's a gentleman, his name is Kirk Sorensen, and he claims that the reason why slavery was abolished was not because of any social dynamics. It's because of the Industrial Revolution and making carbon our slave versus not and harnessing the energy out of carbon, which is freed up a lot of the labor, which basically got us to be nicer to each other. Well, I would agree with that in theory, to some extent, but also, uh, I'm pretty, uh, uh, I'm, I, would, I, I would, I have a tendency to agree with that, the idea that slavery was not ended because of morality, certain morality on the part right. of the United States. And it, uh, I know that Abraham Lincoln was a railroad lawyer. Mm -hmm. Mr. Paydock, you know about railroads, right? Abraham Lincoln was a, was a, was a railroad lawyer. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and you have to, once you understand that he was a railroad lawyer, and at that point the railroads were the biggest industry right. in the country outside of slavery, the agriculture, and, and the Republicans were the people of business, so they get, they pick their guy Lincoln, and they say, "Hey, we don't need these slaves. That's old. That's old technology." So you're basically then sort of agreeing with this. Yeah. Okay. All right. If that concludes our questions, uh, Charlie. Yeah, you don't want to take that easy. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, here we go. Well, <laughs> the history of human rights. Uh, in the world in America. It's very generic. You're saying in the world or in America? Well, it began in ancient Greece with Salon the Long Lawgiver. But it wasn't specific to any white race at all. And even the, the Frenchman you were talking about didn't discuss race, they were talking generic human rights. And the other thing, one last thing that's been confusing me, the Declaration of Independence is not a law, as far as I know. Nobody and I don't know what relevance it has to do with anything. Nobody said it was. The Declaration it's of Independence. just kind of a nice thing. No, the Declaration of Independence was a document designed to promote and give reason and rationale for the war. It was a, it was a PR document. The Constitution is the law. And the Constitution, get this, think about this one. I finally realized this year that once you realize that the Constitution is a contract, it was, it's a contract between the people who own the country. The, the Declaration of Independence was a PR document. Get to order a dinner? Yeah. Okay. Oh, good. Yeah. Uh, let's, I, I uh, let's get into rebuttals. Yes, sir. Okay. First rebuttal? First rebuttal. Okay. All right, let's have a speaker. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to make uh, three or four Somebody uh, was talking about uh, Udi Amin and all the crimes he committed. Well, if you look at the so-called white race, 
We have Hitler, who killed during the uh, First World War. I don't know how many people were killed before Hitler. Are you leaving? And they were all so-called whites. And then we have the Second World War, where some 50 million people vanished from the earth. And crimes against humanity was committed on all sides. And then if you look at the United States and Latin America, we have the death squads going through Central and South America, killing hundreds of thousands of people across the continent, supporting death squads. And if you look at the crimes by the so-called white race against the Indians, we committed suicide, genocide, against the Indians. We eliminated almost all of them. Luckily, a few remain. So if you want to talk about uh, crimes against humanity, the white race has committed so many crimes against humanity, you can't even count them anymore. If you want to read a good book about reconstruction after the Civil War, you can get W.E.D. Du Bois, I forget the exact name, but it's about the Reconstruction period. And there was a lot of uh, African slaves, they were apprentices to white people, became carpenters, became masons, became uh, mechanics, and so forth and so on. And then they opened their own business and were cooperating with some of the poor whites. But then along comes the Ku Klux Klan and uh, kills it off. And now we still have segregation on a massive scale. We almost have a police state in the United States, what happened in Missouri and what is happening all over the United States. We're very, very close to a police state in the United States. Well, I, don't, I could go on and on, but uh, no, that's, no, that's about it. There are <laughs> Uh, somebody give me a poke if I talk too long. Uh, I will give a poke, don't worry. I want to mention a couple books uh, that probably half the audience here is familiar with. Uh, uh, now I'm reading uh, one by Gates about uh, many rivers to cross. It was a TV series. Uh, then there's uh, the Before the May Mayflower by Laron Bennett Jr. That's a uh, a classic, and then I, I read another one, I'm forgetting the exact title, I think it's Slavery in America by the Hortons. These three books cover about the same topic, but it's amazing. I read three, and I, each one I find something new. Uh, I also want to mention, I see Jerry Parker in the audience, the Unitarian Universalist for Social Justice has an anti-racism -racist, uh, task force. And also, uh, I see Brown here, and uh, Jane Addams Sr. Caucus has an anti-racism task force also, uh, and all the people that are on the board of Jane Addams Sr. Caucus have to go through anti-racist uh, training. So if you're a senior uh, uh, here and you want to join Jane Addams Sr. Caucus, come see me. I'll take care of your membership. Maybe you can get into some of these trainings. Thank you. Yeah. And we, you've got plenty of time, so go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I have to rebut one of the statements made by our uh, esteemed speaker that people often react to what he says with different levels of indifference. Um, that they're intimidated by his truth telling by him saying what he says. For me, on the contrary, listening to you, truth telling is reassuring, relaxing, and anything but intimidating. I would take issue also with you referring to David Hume as the light of the enlightenment. 
I know nothing of Hume, nor Locke for that matter, but what about Voltaire? What about the Marquis de Sade? Whom Counterpunch recently reported, apparently telling a holy lie, had 80 orgasms a day over five years. <laughs> Chuck, you mentioned European culture. That's an oxymoron, isn't it? A contradiction in terms? About 20 years ago, not very politically engaged at the time, I was sitting in a bar having a beer with my capitalist pig uncle after having slaved as an employee, employee of his for the day. Um, I don't remember the point the conversation turned on, but even then I was making a defense of democracy, small d. He trumpeted. This, meaning the United States, is not a democracy. It's a dictatorship. I thought at the time he was being facetious. Now I know he meant every word of it. And he was right. And that said dictatorship was in his interests, in the loosest sense of that term. Somebody's mentioned Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence. Um, Let's remember, in the Declaration of Independence, Jefferson referred to the Native Americans as savages. At the very time that the Europeans were visiting genocide on them. How's that for irony? Chuck, you also mentioned Athenian democracy. You know, don't you, that the franchise was very limited to property owners, period. Very limited franchise, not real democracy. Who's the speaker, not me? No, but you're the one who mentioned Athenian democracy. That's right. And somebody else has mentioned that we're close to a police state? Please. This is a police state. I'm reading this morning that the CIA is about to engage in random searches of its passengers for explosives. CTA. 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 What did I say? CIA. Yeah, I'm sorry. CTA. They <laughs> started it yesterday. Well, they said they're blowing up bombs all over. Outrageous. Goodbye, Fourth Amendment. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, this set of college you complex, but we can put kindergarten up here any time, right? <laughs> now, <laughs> and I'm serious. When you were speaking about racism, and you went on the tale of talk about the brand and so forth, and so on, it made a lot of sense to me, because I'm old enough to be part of history. I was born in Mississippi, and what I didn't know, and I'm 70 some years, Grandma, or the uncle, whoever ever spoke about. And guess what? When I got out of the South and could go to a library, because there's a lot of black folks in the library where I live in the 50s and what have you, I got me a, a card. You could get a card and you go and check a book out. And I wish some people would do that. Check a book out. Because guess what's in the book? Some industry. Now, anybody going to say, two little boys arguing about. My daddy can whoop your daddy. My daddy can whoop your daddy. About six, seven years old. And then look, look, one boy going, I'll do the other one. He said, my daddy can eat light bulb. And the, ah. other, boy, and the other boy said, oh, your daddy eat light bulb. I said, yeah, my daddy can eat glass. He said, how do you know your daddy eat light bulb? He said, I heard him tell mama one night, if you turn the lights out, I'll how to eat it. <laughs> <laughs> now, guess what? People. Mm -hmm. I'll forgive them little boy. Why? Because they're six and seven years old. Some grown ass person will sit around and say something like, oh, my government is better than yours, my religion is better than yours, blah, blah, blah. What they call that in the neo some kind of ism? I can't think of it, old, old boys forget. Mm -hmm. oh, uh, somebody like Margaret Mead and, and some of those people, oh, they, they use that word quite a bit because when they went out to do their research and so forth and so on, anthropology, cultural, physical anthropology, they, they, they wanted to straight out what people been doing ever since the beginning of time. My daddy can whoop your daddy. She said, no, I want to know the real culture over here. And she went and lived among these people and so forth and so on. And they said, well, it's something the old something ism or whatever it is. The point I'm making is, that how could anybody
anybody. How can anybody, if they done read two books, can sit around and talk about this country was better than that country? We all know if we done read three books, man. We knew when Egypt, people wasn't shit that Jews include Jesus Christ, Plato, or whoever it was. All of them went to Egypt or Africa at some time or another. Africa was a leader, China, so forth and so on. We remember when, 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 when uh, 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 Greece was the Greece was the intellectual post in the world at the beginning of everything Western. I looked at the television last year; they were standing in line to eat bread. So, don't tell me about who was this and who was that. That by that going, that's the silly stuff in the world. Now, as far as as far as, 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 far as our structure here, that's right. There ain't no democracy. I don't think it ever was a really democratic uh, thing there. But it's showing up ain't more now. Because a democracy belongs to the people, and we don't own shit that the one percent is own the whole thing. So you're playing with yourself, and that's something else you should learn how to do. Because just playing with yourself ain't getting no good feeling. That's double silly. So yeah, double silly. So so so. But the the the, the uh, lesson tonight is that the few always look out for their interests. Now, how can you be such age? Uh, 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 read two books and don't know that. Every system again the time, the few look out for their interests. It didn't give a goddamn what color you are. In fact, before slavery here in the United States, if you read some in the Old Testament or you read some history, uh, Herodotus, you can go back to them folks, and ain't none of them talking about the color of nobody's skin. That was something, like the speaker said, you marginalize people. If you want the world to believe this and believe that lie, just keep repeating it and keep pointing fingers. Now, they ain't gonna say uh, here that you you inferior, you this and you that, and you, uh, he's, he's black and therefore That was nowhere in the books. That was nowhere in the book. One of the leading emperors, uh, at least she played the role called Zenobia. The Roman, when they was, Running uh, between 14 after to 1400 to 14 before and, and 10 more years, uh, 10 more centuries later, when they started declining, the Roman Empire. Zenobia was the Queen of the West, read in the history book. Queen of the West. And, oh, I know who it was, the guy that wrote one big book in his life. The history of Rome, by Rome, you should know that. You know everything else, Dave. Yeah, right, right, right. right. Give it. Edward Gibbon. Right. And, and he describes Sanofi as a dark skinned lady with pearly white teeth. That's in his book. And I, and I read that year, years ago and so forth. But in other words, I brought that up to just to say this. What we practice in the United States, starting back whenever it was, ain't got shit to do with the rest of the world, our history. Go back to history and read the book, and you can see all of this. And as far as this being uh, uh, two or two is fine, people look in your face now and say two and two is fine. And mean it. Yeah. When uh, all, uh, the guy in all of 1984 asked him what two and two, or two, he said four, he said five. Inside the talking to him, talking to him because he wanted two and five. Well, that wasn't no joke. That's real. The guy in charge, two and two is goddamn fine. So he's gonna tell you whatever he wants you to know. Because you you gonna be you he for him two and two is fine. He ain't just playing no game. So that's the same way with the guy in charge. Yes, if we get a time in all the books I ever read, he was looking out for his own ass and his own kind. Now, if you think oh, oh, white folk is you speak is wrong, and, and somebody mentioned that, uh 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 hit uh what the guy from Russia the I find him, Stalin, 60,000, uh, 60 million people. Did he go over to Africa and say, give me some black folks, black skin, and I'm going to kill them. These are white folks to kill. And then you can go all over the world and, and, and people dying by the, there ain't no, there wasn't no black folks to kill, it's white folks. And, and I looked at the uh, TV, like I said, them Greeks had the thing over the face, because they wanted to see them standing in line getting it. All them folks in that land was white folks. And meanwhile, I looked at television over there in Africa, some black folks riding around in Mercedes Benz. Okay. Thank you, man. Good evening. 
Uh, I'd like to mention that uh, there were whites who uh, recognized uh, black people as being uh, equal and being intelligent and did not think of them as animals. One of them was Mark Twain. And when he wrote his book, Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn, he pointed out that the black man that uh, was with Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn, that he would keep them out of trouble by making suggestions that they go ahead and do this or not do that. And uh, he would always lead them toward the right thing so that what Mark Twain was saying was that uh, this black man was actually smarter than white people in general at that time. Uh, I want to also make a correction here that the uh, slavery was not uh, ended because ex directly because of the Industrial Revolution, uh, although it may have been ended indirectly because of the Industrial Revolution. Slave, slavery was ended, I think, around 1864 when Lincoln made the Emancipation Proclamation for the purpose that we didn't want the South sending their blacks to fight our, our northern soldiers, which uh, is what they were getting ready to do, uh, or maybe even had already started doing. So we wanted to discourage black people from uh, uh, coming in and fighting against the North. So we gave them a reason not to fight by saying that, hey, we, the North has decreed your freedom. We've, we've given you an emancipation. Where uh, the South would have, if they had won, they would have said that doesn't mean anything more than toilet paper, and black, you're still slaves, and that's that. So uh, we, uh, the slavery was ended with the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, the war was fought over the Industrial Revolution because that uh, uh, the South was the center of wealth, and uh, with the Industrial Revolution, that had shifted to the north. And so the south felt that if they seceded, that they would be able to um, uh, go ahead and um, charge duties and tariffs, which are expressly forbidden in the Constitution. Uh, they would be able to charge duties and tariffs on their peaches and their pecans and and on their uh, cotton and so forth. So that, uh, I just wanted to make that correction. Uh, there were quite a number of people who recognized that black people were just as good and just as bad as white people. And I would also mention a couple of names like George Washington Carver or uh, Booker T. Washington. And there were numerous others that uh, had done good things and were recognized as being valuable people. So I don't think that uh, black people were ever looked on as being less than human beings by the entire majority of white people. It was wait just minute, some of them that did that. Wait, wait a minute. Wait Thank a minute. you. I'm old stuff. Actually, I wanted to thank the speaker right off the bat. Um, it's really good to hear different perspectives. Uh, you know, a lot of us go about our daily lives and, you know, we interact with people at work and maybe go to the grocery store, you know, and the things we take and do in our own community. And, but we don't always see what's going on around us. Maybe sometimes we're oblivious to it. Um, I'll give you a really funny, good example. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I happened to be walking with uh, another friend of mine and some other people, and we came up to the intersection. I pushed the button to, uh, to get the walk, sig the walk signal. And uh, one of the guys that was in the group, he goes, you gotta wait for the white man. 
And I'm like, what? No, and then I noticed when you saw the, the orange hand, it turns to the white man. And that means you can walk across the street. You know, so. <laughs> but it, from, uh, from my perspective, though, I do get to travel a lot in my, uh, in my job. Uh, I work on commercial heating and air conditioning. And I get to see every side of the city, and I go out into the suburbs. And if you really want to see what would be perceived to me even as discrimination, is you cannot believe the condition of the schools in, in a lot of the city neighborhoods. And then you go out to some of the suburbs, like you know, your Naperville's and your northern suburbs and that, and, and they have like, those schools have air conditioning you know, out there. <laughs> they have swimming pools, you know, and they have like a real gymnasium and all this equipment. And then, then you walk down the hall someplace and they got computer labs. It's just beyond your imagination. There's even middle schools where they give the kids little like tablet computers to take home. The, so these kids have advantages that are like way beyond, you know, that I see in other school districts. Um, another thing I wanted to, maybe, you know, slightly off topic, um, you know, I, I do self-identify as white, okay? But my grandmother on my, or on my mother's side, she was married to a Jewish man. And I don't know if, you know, do I consider myself a quarter Jewish? You know, because well, the Jews are white. You you consider the Jewish people white? No, the, the U.S. Constitution. No, not the U.S. Constitution, but the Supreme Court considered the Jews white. Okay. All right, because uh, you know, if you wanted to think of a, another race or category that's been, you know, the Jews are the Jewish is religion. It's not a it's not a race. Okay. There's some people that might disagree with you on that. You know, the, um, uh, also, uh, the last uh, person that spoke up here uh, was talking about Lincoln. And if I remember my history right, it was Lincoln only freed the slaves in areas of conflict. So they didn't have power. Right. Um, and one more thing I wanted to bring up for the last topic was uh, yeah. the, I asked you the question about child you need beings. A menu, sir? And I, yes, I have also read some books. And uh, some of the books that I've read you say that you should you, take you the you time to find out why the child is acting out okay. and not you just resort to you yeah. know, extreme you know, capital punishment. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, my name is Dan Weinberg. Corporal, not capital punishment. Corporal, right, corporal. Yes. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Black is bad, white is good. This is, I saw Muhammad Ali uh, talk. Black, uh, black hat, evil, the guy, good guys in white hat. What else? Uh, black cat, bad luck. I don't know about a white cat, I guess that's good luck. Black magic? Black magic, that's evil, voodoo. White, white magic, I don't know about white magic. Black ice. Black ice? Black ice, yeah. Right, black right, ice. Right, that's not good. Not good, not good. Uh, Can't see it. Uh, what else? Black ops. Black, black ops. Black, ops. black operations, yeah. The black ice, uh, the black man's ice cubes are not as cold as the white man's. Ah, that's a whole nother. What? I didn't hear it. The black man's ice cubes are not as cold as the white man's. That's the mentality of blacks again. To Inferiority, it's right, called. Right, right. <laughs> like a bomb. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Jews are Jews were decided to be white. Right. I I don't know the case. You'll have to tell me the case. Not a number of cases where Jews, Italians, were through law uh, decided as white. Okay. Okay. Well, I know a lot of Jews who are. Almost your color. They're Ethiopians and they're Jews. But actually, uh, I, I was watching a show a couple of days ago on YouTube uh, about an activist 
a white European Jewish activist <laughs> against the occupation in Israel. And he said he got arrested because he got thrown in jail for two weeks because he, was, he refused to join the army. He's like 25. Anyway, so when he was in jail, who was in jail? The, you know, Ethiopians, uh, Russians, poor Russians, um, uh, Moroccan Jews, Iraqi Jews, Jews with no connections. The, the European Jews had all, you know, they knew lawyers, their parents were lawyers, whatever. Okay, another thing. Lynchings. Um, you didn't mention lynchings. Uh, lynchings were not prosecuted in the South by anybody. Um, thousands of people were killed. It was a big, uh, it was a big event, as I've seen in books. Um, my fam I'm not from the South. Um, my parents were first generation, one was first generation, she, she was an immigrant from Europe. Anyways, um, in, in Egypt, the uh, French soldiers blew off the, uh, shot off the uh, thick lips of one of those statues, one of those things by the pyramids of a, shot off the nose, the nose, the, and the lips, thick lips, African looking lips. Um, that's racism. There's racism in uh, United States prisons. Uh, you go into the uh, right by a Jew. Okay, I'll read this. Um, you go into the prisons. There are a lot of black people and a lot, not a lot of white people. Uh, police are told to go into black neighborhoods and arrest people, and they don't go into Lincoln Park or around here or up to uptown. Well, they go into uptown, but, uh, yeah, I live in uptown. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, um, they don't go into Lincoln park or out by Gold Coast, Gold Coast or by the O'Hare, out, park, out west down. by O'Hare. Wicker Park, Bucktown. <laughs> yeah, that too. Anywhere on the north side. Anywhere on the north side. Yeah. <laughs> Except around Granville and Broadway. Ah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, blacks and Jews, traditionally, in the 60s, uh, some Jews went down to the south and were killed, Goodman, uh, Schwerner, and the other guy? Cheney. Cheney. Cheney was a black guy. So, I mean, the Jews and blacks have a history to, to a certain extent in America. But, of course, America is a is not a fair place. Life isn't fair. But um, that's about all I got. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Sam. Now, Amitra. Thank you. Okay. Obviously, this is my first time here. And uh, here because I have an association with the gentleman who's here. Move your mic down, will you, please? Um, oops. Okay, oh, we go. Um, my name is Mitra Black Thomas, and I just have a couple of comments and observations. One has to do with identifiable difference, and it is the uh, fact, it is the way, the way that we can have racism. Racism is fraudulent, the whole idea is fraudulent, um, but if you want, if you have a lazy workforce, or if you want to delegate assigned roles to certain people so that a minority can be more comfortable than the majority, then you'll use identifiable difference. I haven't seen other women for an I'm identifiably every other speaker in this room so far because I am a woman. Thank you. And if we talk about I appreciate that. <laughs> I must be about money, okay? Uh, but if we talk about, if we talk about discrimination, this is, this is, this is, this, this is a really minor issue. I read and understand what this gentleman is talking about in terms of maximizing our potential. In this country, we have minimized it. We have minimized it by annihilating people and by minimizing their worth. 
Asians were initially minimized because they could be identified as different. Women obviously are different. Many women financed their husbands and their sons throughout slavery, throughout the Industrial Revolution, and yet they were not allowed to vote. And that whole mindset contributed to a culture where women identified more with their white oppressors, their white male oppressors, than they did with other women. So white women in the South, rather than to identify with black women who were nurses to them and cooks for them, identified with their oppressive husbands because people want to be on the upswing. They want to be on top. But I will say in terms of this country, it's just not going to work anymore. And you can bring over as many people as you want to to tell us that being black is bad or inferior. It simply will not work. As someone said, if you read two books, maybe three, you have enough understanding that it is self-destructive to impose color as a main argument for superiority or for productivity. We need, to, we need as much productivity as we can possibly have. And that even, you cannot be predetermined by looking at someone, either because they are by their gender, by their age, or by their race, that they have something to give or something not to give. You may need it. You may need it. And I think that we are profoundly stupid, not just insensitive, not just not nice, we are profoundly self-destructive and stupid to continue on this course. Yeah. And if it hasn't become, and you don't have to be very deep to, to see this, but you go on and do it the way you've been doing it and see if you'll do it any better. You keep doing the same thing, a stupid way, it's called insanity. I wish, and I believe for my grandkids, they deserve better. My grandparents left me a world with their third and fourth grade education. They left me, they got their son into graduate school. They got another son into, <coughs> into law school. And they allowed my brother to be the first black president of Phillips Andover Academy at the same mm. time that George Bush's brother, the smart one, Jeff, is <laughs> at the bottom of the goddamn fucking class. You all don't know that. And it's my saying it you don't even believe it. Because you would think that this trump, that trumps this. It doesn't. It doesn't. You are wasting. We are wasting. Yes, sir. My brother Chicken said this when he was nine years old. We are wasting our, our potential. Okay. We are wasting our talent. We are wasting our energy. And it will not work. Because the rest of the world obviously resents it. And they will make us pay for taking things from them that we had no right to take and then continuing to be arrogant the way we are. If we love this country, if we love these traditions, we will wake up and act right. That's all I have to say. It's the only woman. Yeah, so you don't know who you're, who you're snubbing when you snub somebody. You don't know. It is so what said, I'm saying, we should stop being idiots. We have to do that. It is said in the book of James, what is it that causes wars and suffering amongst you? Is it not your covetousness? Is it not your arrogance or needing a feeling to be better than others? The scripture calls it pride, arrogance. And frankly, the way we human beings are designed, I don't know if we'll ever get rid of the problem of racism. I mean, you can see it now. If any of you have ever really gotten into a serious cubs Sox rivalry, you would see some rather racist fans. However, I do believe that part of the remedy of slavery and racism has to do with the fact that over the last 500 years or so, we've been able to bring society up to a little bit better level of prosperity. And 
that's largely been derived by the Industrial Revolution, particularly first with the power of steam that was able to free up some type of labor and get people out of the fields. Yes, maybe a factory is not the best thing in the world, but in a lot of ways it was better. The structure that Adam Smith talks about of the modern corporation where you get groups of people together to do a common project or a common good, such as bringing the railroads into, into the world and increasing transportation has a lot to do with the getting rid of the institution of slavery. The bringing in of electric power around the 1910s and the economic development that we're able with the labor saving devices also, I believe, had a lot to do with the elimination of slavery. Basically what we did, in a sense, is instead of keeping people as our slave, was made carbon our slave. The carbon derived from the steam engine, the carbon derived from oil, the carbon derived from fire. And as we enslaved carbon, we deslaved people and we're able to treat each other a lot better. Now we're running out of carbon energy. I would hate to see a world run out of it because I think that the institution of slavery and racism would come back with a militancy beyond belief. Fortunately for me, there is an equation that will keep the racism down, keep our prosperity up, and we have to find a new slave. That slave, I think, is going to be Thorium. Oh. <laughs> because it's a safe, powerful reactor. We're never going to run out of this stuff. And if you look at the Thorium Energy Alliance, there's something called the Molten Salt Reactor that will probably be the biggest boom to our economy. The Chinese are working on this concept right now with over 300 scientists. We were the first in the late 60s to do it. It's been around for well over 70 years. What do I say the best way to combat racism is? Economic development, globalization, and the continuation of the communications revolution. I'm not so arrogant, though, as to say we'll get rid of it. Because as it says in the good book, men are sinners. They do have a nature that brings, with free will, that brings a nature of some will always want to be superior to others. Our question is, do we succumb and believe that more debased nature, or do we become prosperous and try to treat each other a little better? today. It goes on because of poverty. People have different standards of what is necessary and what is poor and what is demanded by being respected in your society, in your neighborhood, and 
people you deal with. So, pray for those who are tempted. Uh, the uh, problem with production and the, the uh, industrial age is that we uh, produce for profit. And we produce for private profit because the institutions that uh, are productive, while they are operated by a lot of people, a lot of people work in them, they are privately owned by fewer people. And uh, there is a, a continual concentration of ownership and uh, of uh, the uh, holding of power and of uh, resources that are called capital. And uh, human beings are part of the capital. They are chained to their uh, jobs by uh, by the <laughs> the nexus of starvation. Either you work or you starve, and uh, that's not a very human society. It's not a very respectful society, and uh, yes, racism and ethnicism, nationalism, all sorts of isms, meritocracy, whatever, uh, go to uh, make up the, the rationales uh, for this uh, the differentiation among people. Uh, we've shifted the, the curse of, of uh, Negro slavery in, in the United States uh, and in uh, the Americas uh, has been a great curse. Uh, the word slave comes from the word Slav. The Turkish Empire had a lot of slaves and many of them were Slavs. Uh, they were white but white didn't mean white as it does in black slavery uh, America. It meant that you were uh, being white, you were an underclass in the Turkish Empire. The Turks weren't that much darker than uh, the uh, uh, Europeans uh, that they enslaved. Uh, but people, people look down on the disadvantaged uh, and try to and want to emulate those who are advantaged. And the point of a, a human society is that advantages are made for everybody. So that this land is your land, this land is my land, from Manhattan Island to, to the Redwood Forest, to the Gulf Stream waters, whatever. Yeah. When that comes, and the question is how, how do we get there over all the bullshit that we uh, tend to swallow to our own advantage uh, for our, to cultivate our egos. Okay? Uh, thank you, Charles. You're next. All right. All right, let's thank our speaker again. Very good. All right, cover a lot of area there. I'm going to be eclectic as usual here. First of all, you began by talking about David Hume. Um, who is a Scottish philosopher, and somewhat I don't fully comprehend how it fits in. He's not, he's basically known for establishing causality and and a thing we call empiricism, where you rely on empirical evidence for truth and not just rationalism or think of this. 
Um, he did head up uh, at the, the school which developed natural law, which is a favorite thing of the libertarians. They don't like fiat law or law by a legislative government. They, they believe in natural law. Um, and so, yeah, he, he did form some influence on the Enlightenment, though. I mean, I'm not, I'm not that well versed on natural law. I don't really concur with all that it, it pretends to be. Um, let's see, the next thing is, you know, the European culture, whether we like it or not, in the history, there's a thing called knowledge, that's even something called big history. But if you study the history of civilization, uh, yeah, I know they, they, a lot of it is focused on the European culture. Um, but in fact, it was a predominant culture of the world. Uh, it did undertake, uh, through colonization, they called it mercantilism. Uh, yes, they were out to make money. They were out to exploit people. Uh, they're still at it today. But for one reason or another, it is a predominant culture that embarked on an aggressive campaign uh, to spread itself around the world. And yeah, the negatives, as many, it's both a curse and a blessing. I, there's a great many things about, especially in the, in the women's movement, the, where they were really critical of the European culture. Now, the thing about um, human rights, you have to look upon, uh, you, I, you, you're talking racism here, and you define it as black and white, but human rights is, is how I define it. And we have clauses in union contracts against discrimination. And we say you cannot discriminate on the basis of race, and age, and sex, and religious orientation, and uh, yada, 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 all the way down the list of sexual preference. So it's a thing that all sorts of criteria has been used from one group, a superior group, to marginalize another. Not just one, the whole host. When the European culture found some criteria to marginalize the people of all the colonies that they established, regardless of who they were, they found some criteria. And that's why I say you're just defining it on one, for one version. And no, we have to think larger in the broader perspective of what's operating here. I gave a, a thing in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 98 on its anniversary, and you look more in the larger perspective of human rights, where it came from. I mean, there's, there's discrimination based on religion. I mean, all of that's been a very common one. All of these are operative in, in civilization out there. Uh, whether or not they're unique to that one culture, I would not say so. Um, now, the thing is, this culture, as a matter of fact, far from diminishing it, you can put it down, I don't know what you're going to achieve by that, you've got to recognize that not only has it evolved from occupation or colonization, which is like a 19th century, 20th century kind of thing, now it's embraced, what Tim seems to think is so wonderful, is, is economic globalization in the forms of multi, multinational corporations. And that culture is spreading, um, and it is taking over other cultures. And it is the predominant culture of the world, much as you may not care for it or say, well, it is inherent in the evil concepts. The Chinese, we're not going to become Chinese. The Chinese are going to become like us. You see that now. It's not going to happen. Uh, the Chinese kids. I'm going to talk on December the 13th. I'll show you some photos and some of the things that the kids are picking up. They're they're not going towards the, the old-fashioned kind of way. It's it's like a homogenization. You you can see it in these these malls and supermarkets where they're all the same. 
And they're the same all over the world. You go all over the world, you're going to see the same kind of culture and things that's going on. So this is the process that's going on. Yeah, whether or not... And the, the, the point I'm leading to, it's... And you began on this, is... I think it's translated in, into economic inequality is what it's come down to, and which it probably has always been. And that's what's currently being talked about. And I'm not an apologist for that, but for that guy that was running for president, but he was talking about plain, they just want economic inequality. That's what they and they'll use anything to, to substantiate that. And they're not using the other thing like that. And that's what we're really looking for. And um, I think there's going to be some talkers on that. Um, th that's what I mean. I got some, some figures on this, but uh, it's the disproportionate distribution of wealth. The 99% and 1% kind of is that long so, that line of thinking. But yeah, it's, uh, it's an ongoing thing. I think the human rights concept is, you know, now, you know, the other thing about discrimination, I'm saying people didn't discriminate, my own people were discriminated because we were allegedly commies. You know, I, I mean, I'm going, well, this is rampant all over the place. It's not unique to one area. It's been used anytime once somebody wants to gain advantage over another. But yes, the demographics is right now, we're facing a, a disproportionate uh, allocation of wealth, and those people are going to use anything in their means to sustain it. But anyway, yeah, thanks a lot. You have a lot to talk about. Good to see you. Thank you. All right. Can I say, can I say one thing? Uh, I guess. What's, what's the what's the rules? Who's who's controlling the rules here? What's the what's the rule? Can he say something? Yeah, uh, if he wants to. <laughs> well, I could even That's say it's your turn. Really. Uh, if you look at Egypt, it was the first civilization. What a, what a civilization. The beginning of it is language. It had hieroglyphics. And that was the first language. So that was the beginning of civilization. No, it wasn't. What about Chinese? No, what about Babylonia? Sumerian. Okay. I'm talking about... European civilization. Let's put it that way. Okay. Well, that's an oxymoron. Uh, May I enlarge on the point that I had to yell without a microphone on it? I just did some math here. Uh, I'm not exactly sure when Lucy walked out of Africa. The mother of us all. But uh, if it were, say, just a million years ago, and I think it's many more millions of years than just one. Uh, 25,800 years has occurred 38.7596 times. <laughs> and as such, I don't think you can say we're the first civilization. Occurred. I'm talking about Europe. No, no, I'm sorry. Well, yeah. there were, and there Europe were was not just Germanic. There were before so, yeah. Egyptian, way, way, way before Egyptian. And there was, so there was, Africa. there was, there was destruction of, of all kinds of civilization and, and or uh, societies of some level uh, going back millions of years. Where do you get that number 25,800? 25,800 is uh, the number of times that it takes uh, or, or the number of years uh, a periodic, uh, let's say, destruction of all things that were prior. Uh, it, 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 is, it is a um, something that we celebrated, I believe, on December 21st, 2012. It was a, a periodic, uh, let's say, possible uh, reversal of the Earth's uh, uh, magnetic core. It was uh, widely disseminated. I think I may not be the first person from whom you have heard that. No, you're not. That, that was, isn't that Maya? Isn't that a Mayan idea? That's a Mayan idea. And, uh, but if you just consider the fact 
it, it is impossible. You don't know of any single society that occurred 25,000. Tell me about a society you know of from 25,800 years ago. And I'll, I'll have to call you a liar because we know of, we have no such information. <laughs> and it happened 38 times in one minute. <laughs> So what's next? Okay. Speaker takes the final word and the final cut, and okay. then uh, we'll dismiss after that. Okay. So how long do I have? Two minutes. Uh, minute you minute. got you oh, got us hours. half an hour if you want it. But you know we we, we the restaurant wants us out by nine. It's only eight twenty six. Okay. Um, please speak and speak your piece. Okay. Go ahead. This gentleman wants to say something before I say something. Oh, uh, it's going to ask you who you were supporting for governor and why. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, and why? And, and I don't know why. Ah. <laughs> okay. Next. Um, I want to say something. Something that Mr. Paydock said. And I forgot something that somebody else said. I can't remember. They said something that I didn't agree with. I forgot what it was, but maybe I'll cover it later. <coughs> because Paydock made such a, uh, a statement that I disagree with that it probably encompasses uh, everything. He tends to do what I see that is too prevalent among many people who think they're part of the dominant race. He poo poos anything that is designed to change and improve things based on the model which we say we believe in. He gives um, a free pass to anything that deviates from what we say we believe, what our system says it's about. He says, well, that's just human nature. That's just the way things are. Grow up. That's his answer. And I think for an intelligent man, I'm disappointed. It seemed like he would come up with something better than that. Because I could go into any street corner here in Chicago and hear the same excuses from ignorant people. People without education. People who are not even considered white. So I, I just don't, I, I, I'm disappointed. You can, you can do better than that. Don't just, well, hey, you know, it's just the way nature is, and that's life, and that's it. Imagine if our, even our founding fathers, as flawed as they were, if they had believed that. Well, you know, that way, oh, well, you know, the king, he's okay. <laughs> you know, well, you know, well, you know, uh, why don't we just leave things as they are? You know, I mean, so what? So they own all the land and, and we got to pay the taxes. Well, you know, you know, the king's got to eat too. <laughs> it's that <laughs> namby-pamby, well, that's just the way things are. And what would this country be? I mean, as bad as things are now, they're a lot better than they would be if everybody thought like that. Come on. We have, theoretically, a constitution. We have, theoretically, a form of government that was new to the world. We have supposedly an idea of a democratic republic, a self-governing society of humans who are intelligent enough to govern themselves. And yet, nothing that he says says that that's possible. Humans, are not, based on what he said, humans are just not capable of that. Give them some slack. What do they call it? Laser fair? Just, just, you know, 
Let it just flow. You let it go. Come on. It, it takes me, a barely graduate from high school, an ad man, a recovering ad man, to have to tell this man who's probably benefited from all of the good things about this country, this society, the things that work, the guarantees, the unions, the social security, all the stuff that he would have said, well, you know, so uh, that's just the way it is. The, the, the companies don't want to pay us anymore. They don't want to uh, uh, let us retire. They want us to work 18 out. Well, hey, companies got to eat. The, you know, the boss has got to eat too. That's his attitude. And not just him. I don't want to single him out. Although he bears, he needs singling out. But there are others here who didn't have the courage to say what he said, who think the same thing, or worse. And the problem is, now if you so-called white people were the minority, if it was reversed, where you were like 15% of the country and the others were 85, then I wouldn't worry what you think. It wouldn't matter. But you guys have been in the majority since it started. And instead of trying to make it better, the only time you do anything is when we protest and we make it a big scene. We make a big scene. Right. Then we dra you drag into, oh, well, we pass laws. <laughs> laws are not culture. Laws are not morality. Laws are not principles. And your, from your perspective, hey, principles and that's the, laws are the thing. And if you can't, if you can get a law passed and everything's fine, you know better than that. <laughs> the only rights you have are the rights defined by law. But we're not talking just about rights defined by law. We're talking about morality. If you don't have uh, principles and morality, you don't have lo good laws. You have immoral laws. You know how many laws there are in countries all over the world that are immoral, that are inhuman? If you want a law or feeling in your heart. One fool at a time, please. Choice. It's not an either or proposition. There is no, that's a false proposition. Oh. You laugh, but you oh. but but it's not. Laugh, go ahead and laugh, but you're wrong. Right? You're wrong, right? You should. You're, you're a big enough man to admit when you're wrong. Actually, Come on, admit it. You're wrong. We need morality. We need principles. We need laws. And laws are based on principles. It's not the other way around. Am I right or am I wrong? Right. You're right. Okay, I'm right. Right. Isn't what he's saying, this is the end of history? Fukuyama? Capitalism is the end of history? If capitalism is the end of There's history, and the whole earth is going to be flooded. That's what he's saying. It's nothing that's good. right. That's what he's saying. That's You're right. Fukushima. Who's Fukuyama. 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 Who's talking about Fukushima? No, Fukuyama. Fukuyama. The end of, he wrote the end of history. Oh, yeah. Capitalism well, is the end yeah, of right history. Right-wing nutbags do a lot of stupid things. Ah. But that's what he's what saying. I'll get you some more iced tea. Fukushima. No, Fukuyama is his last name. He wrote the end of history. Capitalism is the end of history. That would mean global warming is going to sink the earth. That's what he's saying. Right. Yeah, so what I'm saying is that we humans, we supposedly are the only uh, animals who are capable of self-determination and thinking. Yeah. Now, that may not be true, but that's what we believe. And we think, and we say we think, that we're capable in this country of self-government. Now, based on what Paydock's saying and others I've heard are saying, we're not really capable. They don't believe we're capable of self-government. We're only capable of letting the Americrats govern us. We're 
capable of, 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 of being, as somebody said, the, the people who bend over and let the Americrats saddle us and ride us. That's what, we, that's what he believes we're capable of. And we're lucky that they let us do that, that they let us ride them on our backs. We should be, we should be grateful to Mitt Romney, because he's the job maker, he's the job creator. Huh. What will we do without the job creator, right? Yeah, right. That's what Mr. Paydock seems to believe, but maybe I'm wrong. Oh. Uh -huh. I may be putting words in his mouth. Yes. Yes, you are. I may be. He probably wears a tutu at midnight, like Hoover, J. Edgar. No, I would not. Uh, I would not concur with that one. Ah. <laughs> I would not go. I would not <laughs> do that. Yes. I said Even probably. If it's <laughs> I said probably. <laughs> anyway, so I just want to conclude by saying that I think it may be a good idea for everybody in this room to think of this country as being something different and separate from the rest of the world in terms of its formal government, its potential future, to actually start to believing in the ideas, the good ideas that we say we believe in, and actually try to make and create a country where all men actually are treated equally as a group, where individuals can exceed and succeed, but that groups of people no one group is is inherently better than another group. That's what we say we believe. That's the form of government that we live in. You guys might as well, based on what I hear, or a lot of people, not everybody, a lot of people might as well pack up and go over to uh, Russia. <laughs> or move over to, yet they tell blacks, hey, why don't you guys go back to Africa? Well, I've never been to Africa. <laughs> And people of my, my lineage have been here a lot longer than probably most people in this room in terms of where I'm from. So if you want somebody to go back, somebody who, if you don't believe in the country, you don't believe in the Constitution, you don't believe in equal rights, you don't believe in the principles, the founding principles and democracy or the idea of a democratic, if you don't, go to wherever you're from. You're from Ireland, go back to Ireland. Italy, go back to Italy. Because I believe in this country that we actually can, as sentient, intelligent human beings, actualize and realize what we say we believe in. And that's what my book is about. That's what I'm about. Yeah.